As you know, on Sunday night or Monday morning of every week, we post a new expository semiotics explaining why we would choose which lectionary readings. But in these readings, our dream is and our, our desire is to help you read the signs and fondle the details and spot the seminal metaphors, the condensed signs and the stories that are key for preaching to a digital culture. So strap on your seatbelt and join us as we prospect our passages for today. Welcome to the third Sunday of Easter, the 1st of May, 2022. There's so much here in our lectionary passages for for reflection and rumination and research and and just rejoicing. And the psalm, it begins with the psalm 30, weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Or weeping may tarry. I like that better, actually, the King James. Weeping may tarry for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And then, as for me and my house, I thought when I was reading it, I just skipped over it. We shall serve the Lord. No. As for me and my house, that's another passage. I said in my prosperity, I shall never be moved. Uh, I, I shall, I shall, I shall not be moved. Any Sunday school ditties come to mind with that? Um, and these psalms, we've been hearing a lot about supply lines and about, uh, you know, the, the whole... Um, problem of, of getting things from one place to another and and, and uh, just helping to, to get things where they need to be and helping to, things to move. And in many ways, the Psalms were like the, the supply lines of, of the Hebrew people. They, they provided, they were provisions for strength and nourishment and, and nurture when, when people here uh, needed it the most, uh, the supply lines of our ancestors were these psalms. We, we have in John the, um, well, we have Acts 9, 1 to 6, and that, or you could also do the whole story, 7 to 20. And this is the classic story of Paul on the road to Damascus and his Damascene moment. And I actually did, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, a whole Lent talk just on uh, how to slow down this story to really inhabit the semiotics of of what is going on here. And um, so I'm not going to redo that. The John 21, 1 to 19 is the gospel reading, this miraculous catch of fish, one of Jesus' post-resurrection appearances. Remember in all of them, they don't recognize him. And uh, here they don't either. Uh, and, and then even when he counsels them to... Um, to, to cast your nets on the other side. And it wasn't until they had this miraculous catch of fish that um, it must be the Lord. But I'm going to pick a strange one today for to ponder over with you and to probe a bit. And this is Revelation 5, 11 to 14. And let me just read it. Um, as I'm reading it, I may just make initial kind of stops, but then we're going to really uh, labor and uh, love over... Um, a little phrase that we tend to forget the significance of it. It occurs twice. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Let me just stop there for a minute. I just want to just point something out. This is a phrase, a favorite praise and worship song. Almost every composer has got to have a worthy song. But notice how a lot of them have become not worthy is the lamb as we celebrate and praise the lamb that was slain. But Listen how we've rephrased it. You are worthy, Lord, to receive my praise. You are a worthy God. You are worthy. Now, now notice the difference. What a difference. I mean, one is we're, we're 
affirming the worthiness of the Lamb. The other one, we're affirming, in our eyes, you are worthy enough, God. And so who who's really God there? Who's really in the superior position? You are worthy to receive my praise. You are worthy to receive our praise. So I love Worthy is the Lamb songs. I I really uh, shake and, and, and tremble in somewhat fear of our, you are a worthy God. You are worthy enough to receive my praise. Now, it's not that blatant, but you are worthy to receive our praise. And um, to me, it's a, it, it, you may not hear the difference. For me, it's a, it's a huge difference. In Asian cultures, you would never tell an older, an elder, oh, I think that's a good idea. Because that's putting you in a position to judge whether the idea is good or not, or, or bad. Um, and this is what, when we're telling God, God's worthy enough to receive our praise, we're elevating ourselves to above, to above God, to tell God, well, in, in my est estimation, you're, you're worthy enough. Anyway, okay, now here it comes. Now we turned before the living creatures. And here we have, in verse 14, the four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Now, four living creatures. What were the four living creatures? And we just go over that phrase, and we don't have, what meaning does it have? Well, it has incredible meaning. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Um, the four living creatures are what are called... A tetramorph. And a tetramorph is a composite being, a hybrid creature, if you will, that is comprised of one, one being, but it's comprised of four different, different elements. Um, and the four living creatures that John here of Patmos sees in the book of Revelation is a reworking, a reframing of the four living creatures in the vision of Ezekiel. Now you can look here at Ezekiel 1, 5 to 28, or Isaiah 6, 2. But here is Ezekiel 1, 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a human and the face of a lion on the right side. And they had, f and the four, they four had the face of an bull on the left side they four also had the face of an eagle now when they come together like this so you've got remember you've got a human you've got a bull you've got a lion you've got an eagle um they are known as when they come together it's known as a tetramorph because it's four features but it's known as a you're right cherubim the seraphim are the highest of all the heavenly beings. Uh, big, ma massive creatures with deep, incredible wings. But the, the cherubim, seraphim, cherubim, are next on the uh, ascending uh, or descending. The seraphim are the highest, and the next highest are the, the cherubim. Um, now, cherubim are the cherubim is the plural of cherub. And when you think of the word cherub, you're not thinking here biblically. You're thinking Renaissance. Renaissance, they had these cute little cupids. They called pooty, P-U-T-T-I, pooty. And these pooty were had little, little tiny little little uh, an angel wings, and they were really cherubs, cupids, and sometimes they had arrows. And no, no, no. This is much earlier. Um, the cherubim. In the Bible, these composite beings, these of four living creatures, were the guardians of the tree of life. They stood at the entrance of the Garden of Eden. You see this in Genesis 3, 24, 1 Samuel 4, 4. Um, not to guard uh, with, with flaming swords, not to keep people out of the Garden of Eden so much as to protect the tree of life, which we had been banished from. We were less banished. We read this story carefully. We were less banished from the garden. Yeah, we're sad, but we were really banished from that tree of life, which is what kept us breathing the divine breath, the divine oxygen. And uh, that kept us immortal. And once we sinned and fell, we were uh, 
separated from that tree of life. And so the cherubim were protecting that tree of life from uh, our coming back and achieving that kind of immortality that God made us initially to have. The cherubim were also the guardians of the Ark of the Covenant. And their outstretched wings came together in the middle of the Ark to form this throne called the, you know what it's called, the Mercy seat and it was seen as kind of the the chariot uh, the mercy seat was like the chariot and when the bible talks about uh, that that what we were uh enoch was swept up on wings of the wind i mean this is really the a description of the the seat of this chariot of from the cherubim um and um so important was this Ark of the Covenant, that in many ways the city of Jerusalem was itself considered holy, largely because the Ark was located there. That was the significance of the Ark. It was so important, and hence the, hence the cherubim. Um, if you remember, two Sundays ago, um, my Lent talk on Easter Sunday focused on how Jesus became the new Ark of the Covenant. And how when Mary looked in, she saw these two angels on either side of this rectangular slab of limestone, which semiotically looked just like the the Ark of the of the Covenant. Jeremiah three sixteen predicted the day when the Ark would no longer be required, which is underlined by Hebrews nine four. Uh, the whole chapter of Hebrews, actually, where, where Christ is the high priest who dwells eternally in the presence of God. And let me just read you this Jeremiah text, because it, it shows that Jesus now becomes, as the high priest, um, and making the Ark of the Covenant no longer um, the Holy of Holies, like it once was. And it shall come to pass when it be multiplied, and it, when you be multiplied, increased in the land. In those days, they shall say... No more the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Neither shall it come to mind. Neither shall they remember it. Neither shall they visit it. Neither shall they be done, that be done any more. Now there's no need for an Ark. Why? Because Jesus has become the Ark. And just as when the high priest, the first one, Aaron, left the Holy of Holies after doing the, the holy rituals on the mercy seat, and before he left, though, he'd take off his clothes and leave his clothes there in the Holy of Holies. So Jesus does the same as he leaves on resurrection morning and leaves his clothes behind. Here's Hebrews 9. I'm just going to read a couple of verses here, starting with 11. But when Christ came as the high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, there's that red heifer again, sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, Offered himself unblemished to God, cleanses our consciences from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. And this is just skipping to 24, 25, verse 24 and 25, Hebrews 9. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. That was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the Holy Holy every year, with blood that is not his own. Um, and the high priest emerges from the Holy of Holies still alive after having presided over the sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat it is a sign that the sacrifice has been accepted and the people can count on a good future stretching before them. Jesus left the tomb alive. He left the Holy of Holies alive. And announcing by the angels, he is not here, he's alive, leaving the mercy seat behind forever. Because he now is the mercy seat, sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Now there were two 15 feet tall cherubim guarded 
that guarded the veiled entrance to the Holy of Holies. These were carved with olive wood and covered with gold, just like the cherubim were in the Ark of the Covenant itself. And on one end of either ends. And embroidered in the tapestry of the veil. And, and throughout the, the, the tabernacle and the temple both. But in the veil itself was embroidered um, the images of the cherubim, two cherubim, um, one on either side of the of the veil. Now you say, what? Why, why is this? Why even bother with this week? What is you know? This is this is biblical stuff, but isn't it a little fanciful? Uh, isn't it a little mythical? Isn't it? Well, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. Um, for fifteen hundred years, the Bible was not a book. It it was communicated as what was called, what became known as an illuminated manuscript, all right? A monk would have spent his entire life in the, the basement and dungeons of a monastery with no light, just enough, just enough of a candle to enable him to, to transcribe one um, gospel. And of course, he'd, on either side, with all the floralasia and and images, they would, that's why they're called illuminated manuscript. I call them history's first web pages. But they would, they would spend their entire life just beautifying one book of the Bible, one of the Gospels, for example, never expecting anybody in their lifetime to see it but God. Wow, a devotion. But for example, if they did the Gospel of John, the, the front page, the top of it, wouldn't announce the Gospel of John. You just see an eagle. If they were doing Mark, it wouldn't say the gospel according to St. Mark. You would have a lion. If it was Luke, you wouldn't say the gospel according to St. Luke. You would just have a, a bull. Some say an ox. I like to say bull. Um, if you had Matthew, you would just have a, a human with, with wings. But all of them had wings. But... What what is going on here? This is the this is the four features of the four living. These are the four living creatures that together put together in this composite form, created a a cherubim. And Irenaeus, he just he died before two hundred. So we're talking about living in the the second century. Um, was the first as we know of to associate the four living creatures with the four gospels and. Um, and from then on, it just became, became standard. Now, let me give you a little hierarchy um, of the, these, these creatures, these heavenly creatures, um, and um, the hierarchy, if you will, among uh, the, the angelic beings. And this was first explicated in, in this kind of organizational form by Dionysus the Areopagite in the 5th century. And he put them together in three groups of threes. Now they were before scattered and he just said this is how they're organized. This is the hierarchy of heaven for these these angelic creatures. Uh, and the first sphere, the closest to God, the, uh, the last three, or the last pairing, are the closest to humans. And what spend the, the ones that spend most of their times with with humans so um the the closest the first sphere and and the, really the ones who serve god the angels and archangels serve humans but the ones who serve serve god the seraphim cherubim and thrones seraphim the highest next come cherubim and then the thrones the seraphim uh, the burning um uh, these burning angels, angelic beings that are the protectors of the throne of God, these massive, uh, huge creatures that sometimes act as messengers. Um, remember, it was a seraphim that directed Moses at the burning bush to uh, remove your shoes. This is holy ground. But most of the time, they're there uh, to protect uh, the, the divine throne. The cherubim, these four faces of an ox, a lion, an eagle, and a uh, and a human. Um, 
guard the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life. Um, they're the most elevated of the angelic orders that deal deal with humans. Um, Philo called the cherubim the symbols of God's highest and greatest power, goodness, and sovereignty. Uh, when we do see them, um, even while they're performing their duties, they're, they're still praising God uh, unceasingly. The thrones of the elders uh, facilitate the prayers of humans and, and listen to the words of God. There are 24 elders mentioned in the book of Revelation. So you've got these, these three, these, the first triad, the seraphim, cherubim, and, and thrones of elders. Um, the second sphere are, are best described as the ruling or governing angels. And here you have dominions. Um, these are beautiful beings with two wings, pretty much how, like you would imagine an angel. The virtues, also called strongholds, these angels perform miracles and signs in the world and collectively they're called the holy virtues because this is their, their specialization. They just specialize in, in the virtues. And then there's the power or authorities, the warrior angels, the, the keepers of order. And um, they're responsible for uh, casting out evil spirits, keeping the, the planets and the stars in, in space. Um, but then the third sphere, the, 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 the sphere that is closest to humanity, it, the ones closest to earth have, have three, the principalities and rulers, the archangels, archangels and the, the angels, the principalities and rulers, protectors of nations, institutions, uh, the principalities specifically, they wear, um, they carry scepters, they wear crowns, um, their duties are to carry out the dictates of the upper spheres, uh, the two triads above them. The archangels, um, and these we hear the most about. They're really the commanders of the angels. Uh, there are seven archangels who are guardians of the world, and they are um, named in Enoch, Enoch 20, which is not a part of the canon, but some of this is called pseudographic. Um, you know, apocryphal writings, but they're really, really more, there's a lot to be learned from them. And um, there's Uriel, Raphael, Ragel, Michael, Sariel, Gabriel, and Jeremiel. And then the angels are guardian angels, and they're the lowest of the celestial spheres. And they're sent as messengers, as heralds, and personal angels to watch over individuals or guide them. If you're an Appalachian, you come out of Appalachian culture, one of the signs that you're a true Appalachian is that you know, when I talk about a painting of a guardian angel helping an older sister and a little brother across a rickety bridge, when I just say that, you immediately can come up with uh, an image. Um, and this is a badge of growing up in, in Appalachian culture. You grew up with this painting. It was on the wall. It was laminated on on uh, boxes, uh, jewelry boxes, music boxes, um, and it was etched deep into the imagination of every Appalachian child, this, this guardian angels, based on Psalm 91, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all, in all your ways. Um, so we have this, the, these, uh, a ninefold tier, three sets of threes, beginning with uh, the highest seraphim, the lowest, the angels um, of heavenly beings. The second highest are these four living creatures, the cherubim. Um, now, the, you say, well, I don't, I don't believe in angels. Well, you're, the, you're not the only one. Sadducees didn't believe in angels in Jesus' day either. Uh, they didn't believe in the resurrection either. Um, but um, the problem that the early church had was just the opposite. Some of them got so enamored of these heavenly creatures and that they, they began worshiping the angels more than Jesus. And so there was a problem of angel worship. And, and Revel Revelation 19.10, 22 and 9, prohibits the worship of angels, and, as well as Paul warns of how demons sometimes masquerade as angels. So you, you can't really and shouldn't really uh, even think of worshiping them because you may be worshiping a demon. That's Second Corinthians eleven, fourteen to fifteen. Now, I, I, um, 
I believe that there are uh, angels um, and um, and I love uh, I don't have I don't know if they're organized <laughs> like uh, like this was done by Dionysus the Areopagite but um, I do know that these four heavenly creatures captured the imagination of much of, of church history. And even Christians put it, uh, and throughout time, especially in the medieval period, when they loved doing gargoyles and these mythical beings, they put these, these cherubim and and based on the Hittite griffins, um, which were two or more of these creatures, uh, in their furniture. And I'm going to show you some pictures just in my house of some of this this uh, this furniture. By the way, you if you wonder where you get these four living creatures from, um, how do they come? It's based in Genesis, where you remember when God partners with the first human, the first Adam, and... Um, says in response to it is good it is good it is good you know you got and then you got one it is not good uh, it is not good for adam to be alone alone we have to make an azer so the first candidates for azer so what does god do god let's 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 have some candidates for for an azer for your for somebody to save you from your loneliness that's really what e-z-e-r azer means um and so it says here, and and Adam named all the beasts of the field. And as Adam, it's really participating in their being. When you name something, you, you call out its being. Well, what's the king of the beasts of the field? Ah, lion. And then he, he named all the birds of the air. What's the king of the birds of the air? The eagle. And then he named and called into being all the domesticated animals. What's the king of the domesticated animals? The bull, the ox. But still no azer for Adam was found. And this is when God puts Adam into this uh, anest anest deep anesthesia, this deep sleep, splits the Adam, and you have now the fourth candidate for an azer which is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh and woman comes out of man and um this is the fourth living creature and this is the this is you understand the significance of this in the symbology here a woman represents the whole human species because the fourth living creature is we call it a a human, but from the biblical story, that human is a woman who stands for all of humanity in these tetramorphs, in these chera, cherubim. Um, I believe God's angels need no wings. Some angels are people. Um, some angels are ideas. You ever just be transformed and transfixed and transfigured by by an idea, a revolutionary idea that changes everything and leads to metanoia? Some angels wear rags, some angels wear collars, some angels smell of cigarettes, some of incense. But all angels, and the key to an angel is that an angelic force or being transitions you from one state of being to another. In other words, angels, all nine of these are intermediaries between heaven and earth, between the invisible and the visible. And whatever turns the invisible into visible is, I believe, an angelic force in, in your life. So one of the greatest angelic forces in my life is music, is sound. Um, because sound moves things from the invisible to the visible, from the physical to the spiritual, from spirit into matter. And if spirit can become matter through sound, then matter can become spirit again. 
through song. We know um, from superstring physics that matter is basically vibrating strings of energy, which means matter itself is, is music. And music is what turns the, and God said, sang, let there be light, the invisible into the, the visible. Now, there are a lot of, a lot of angels that we can talk about. Um, Paul had a band of angels. Um, his band of angels were bait, patrons, benefactors, uh, Chloe, Priscilla, Junia, Phoebe, Thecla. These were, this was Paul's donors and benefactors. Um, I love just saying to somebody who's blessed you and incredibly, you're an angel. Call them out. Name them. You're an angel. Thank you for being an angel to me. Uh, if somebody has uh, given you a, a blessing, a, a bounty, and whatever it is, and they're part of your band of angels. Um, I think people who hold up things, I call them Atlas angels. You know, Atlas held up the world. And, and these are people that are holding up. Uh, your arms for ministry, your your Barnabas angels who are encouraging you and holding up, lifting up your arms for for ministry as Barnabas did to to the disciples. So there's a lot of ways of of talking about these these um, seraphim, cherubim, and then all the way down to archangels and and angels. I, I want to end with a, a a a story. It's a it's a story. Um, it, it is not a biblical story, but it is a a part of Jewish mysticism. Now, up until um, the 1500s, the primary form of Jewish mysticism was called was came from the Zohar, and uh, so you have the Zohar Kabbalah, and then in the 16th century. Um, the guy's name was um, Isaac uh, Luria. And I, I forget, it was like he, he lived like from 1530s to 1570s. So he didn't live that long, but what an impact he had. And he, he encouraged, he created, it was kind of the bridge from medieval mystic, Jewish mysticism to, to modern Jewish mysticism. And he, he was doing riffs on, now, what, what Jewish mysticism, you have Christian mystics, you have Jewish mystics. What Jewish mysticism did, they do riffs on the Torah and riffs on the prophets. And, and they just, so what if? And what if? And these are all these hypotheticals. But they would lead them in these all these, these mystical directions. And one of Luria's, one of, in, in the Lurianic tradition, there is this... Um, this contemplation of what happens when God decides to create the world. When God exists and God only exists in, in this relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, that's all there is because God feels everything. God is in everything, of everything, and that's all there is, is God. God fills everything because God's power fills all that there is. So for God to create the universe, God has to make space for it, okay? So because God has to kind of get rid of some, at least compact and compress and contract and, and condense it, the, the divine to allow for the, this new creation called the universe. And so in this uh, Lurianic, uh, kind of thought experiment. So how does God go about that when God is everything and is in everything and pervades everything and fills everything? And so God's got to kind of, um, kind of contract the very being of God, compress it, compact it. Um, and in this Lur Lurianic thought, what God did was God as God is compressing and contracting the divine presence, God put it into, once God kind of got it into a, a compact form, God put it into these vessels. God created vessels to hold 
the, the divine presence so that there would be room to create the world. Uh, if you don't have something like this, you're a pantheist. Everything is God and God's, God is everything. So what the Jewish tradition was very sensitive to in this form of mysticism was we don't, we don't want to be pantheists. So you have these, these vessels, all different kinds of vessels. Um, these vessels that are um, in this new world that God had created as well, as well as in the world that, in which God lives. And, 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 and over time, though, the, the divine presence, the supernal light, if you will, was too strong for these vessels. And so they exploded these vessels into these shards and scattered them everywhere over the universe and in the heavens. And, and so there's these shards of divine presence that are scattered everywhere um, in, in all different forms. And the purpose of living a Torah life and following the Torah and loving the Torah was for this, this Jewish tradition, this Jewish uh, Lurianic tradition was to put yourself in a place and posture where you could receive as a gift the discovery of these shards. And then when you turned them over, when you turned over the shards, when you entered into relationship with these shards and turned them over, you were, had this bounty of blessing and benefaction of God's presence and beauty, and holiness, and glory. And so you, you followed the Torah, you loved the Torah, you lived the Torah, so that the shards of divine glory, what we call it, uh, we see through a glass dimly, um, but then we'll know face to face, but these, the, these dim glasses, if you will, um, that we would, um, position ourselves in a place to receive. And that's how I look at at these angelic beings, these composite beings, these four living creatures, if you will, that there are certain people, certain places, the, the Irish call them thin places, that are, that are in, it, this is a metaphor, okay? <laughs> I'm not quoting scripture, I'm just giving you a metaphor from the Jewish mystical tradition, but um, there's certain people, certain places, certain periods where if you're in a place and, and position to receive this gift, this surprise shard, and you in a relationship with it and turn it over, um, you experience the glory and awesomeness of God in almost supernal, supernatural ways. And that is what I'm hoping for you this week, that you will be open to the shards of God's beauty, to the shards of the Creator's magnificence and munificence, and that you will enter into relationship with those surprising shards, turn them over, and be blessed. Be an angel. Discover an angel. You're an angel.